So thank you for introducing me and my co-authors. So I, <laughs> I don't have to do it. I'll, uh, the one thing I will um, uh, tell you is this is a, a project that I, I don't think I found yet the right way to present. So let's, let's see how, how, <laughs> how this goes, especially in the compressed format. Sure. Um, as you all know, standard models of delegation make the point that delegation happens because principals want to take advantage of dispersed information that agents presumably have. And this is an area of economics where there's a lot more theory than there is evidence. And this is not only relevant in firms, but also in government. Um, and decentralization, which has been a major wave over the last 40, 50 years, was, I think, largely predicated on this idea that governments needed to get closer to where citizens were to exploit information that maybe frontline providers and middle managers had. This applies also when states or governments are trying to roll out new monitoring technologies to improve the performance of frontline providers that, who are sometimes hard to hold to account. And we encountered this issue when the government of Paraguay in 2014 decided to roll out a new monitoring technology, specifically issuing phones with a GPS capability to um, agricultural extension agents, whom I'm going to call AEAs henceforth. Um, and the idea was that in, in this way, the direct supervisors of these agents would know where they were, and that would help uh, monitor. Now, one issue that uh, arose is that the government didn't have enough money to give all the agents phones. And this raised two questions. One, what should be the scale of rollout be? That is, how many agents should get phones? Uh, how much should we work hard to try to expand that share, if, if, if that would be possible? And second, given that only a subset were going to receive phones, should the direct supervisors be making the choices uh, of which agents should get the phones? Presumably because they would know which agents would react more strongly or be most responsive to being monitored. Now, the challenge is that the answers to these questions on the optimal scale of rollout and what the best organizational mode is, i.e. whether you should delegate the, the targeting decision um, are interdependent. The amount of information that the supervisors may have relative to the center, that is the top ministry hierarchy, uh, matters for whether you want to decentralize or not. And the value of the supervisor's information and therefore the decision to decentralize partly depends on the scale of the plan rollout. Uh, if you were close to treat everybody because you have a lot of money, then maybe you don't care to ask the supervisors to choose. Uh, but it turns out that also the optimal rollout scale that you should be striving for depends on whether the assignment is going to be made in a centralized or decentralized way. So it's kind of like a circle. Everything depends on everything. So our contribution in, in this project was the, the first step was to do a plain vanilla impact evaluation of seeing whether the new monitoring technology helped AEA performance as measured by the share of the farmers that they visit. That's the main thing they do to visit farmers and, and give them assistance. But then we did a number of less standard things. One was to determine whether uh, the supervisors uh, have valuable information about who should receive these phones. Uh, then we measure the value of the supervisor information or of the decentralized choice at different levels of coverage. And we identify the optimal rollout scale for decentralized versus decentralized approaches. And we did this without running a whole bunch of different treatments with different levels of saturation, uh, as you will see. Uh, one step in order to bypass that was to develop an approach to decompose the supervisor informational advantage between things that are presumably observable and we as analysts and eventually central government could hope to observe and things that we would be very hard for anybody but supervisors with direct personal contact to observe that we call unobservable. 
And so then we're going to evaluate the decision to decentralize uh, based on the information that the principal could conceivably get in different counterfactual scenarios relative to supervisors. So there's a, a number of strands of literature, great work that the paper connects to. One is, um, I, I mentioned that there's very little work on the value of discretion uh, and decentralized choice. There's uh, an exception is a recent paper by the Flo and co-authors on uh, plant inspections. The key difference is we're going to get to the value of uh, supervisor information, but relying more strictly on uh, experimental variation that we introduce through our design rather than on, by imposing structure. Uh, there is a literature that has highlighted the importance of information frictions in uh, creating or pushing for uh, decentralization in organizations. Um, so that's clearly related. There is a dense literature on the targeting of social programs and to what extent sometimes you can rely on local information and do better than proxy means testing. And there is also a literature on the introduction of information and communication technologies or ICTs uh, to improve the performance of frontline providers by increasing monitoring. So we're going to connect to all of these by providing an experimental approach to measuring the value of decentralized choice at different rollout scales and under different information benchmarks when we compare decentralization to different versions of sophistication or state capacity uh, at the center. So let me quickly tell you about the setting and the research design. So uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, done in the context of agricultural extension services. These are seen and were at the time seen by the government of Paraguay as a central component in the uh, fight against poverty. And uh, the agents uh, that we're going to work with work in district level offices called ALATS, uh, each one of which has a supervisor overseeing these agents. And each agent typically works with around 80 farmers. Um, the, the supervisors themselves, they oversee AEAs, but they are also catering to their own share of farmers. And what these AEAs do is they have a tough job. They have to visit farmers who are dispersed over the territory and they have to do it on their own dime. And the key monitoring difficulty is supervisors don't know where the AEAs are or whether they are even going and seeing the farmers they're supposed to see. So uh, because of that, the ministries of planning and agriculture introduced these phones with GPS technology through a staggered rollout design that we exploited for identification purposes. Uh, the phone would have an app that the A would have to turn on. This would stamp the GPS coordinates every 15 minutes. Um, and they could also use the phone to record information during their visits. Uh, 42 of the alats have only one AA. Those are what we call small alats. And 44 have more than one. And these are going to be the core of our uh, analysis. For the plain vanilla impact evaluation, we're going to use both, but for the core design and the delegation question, we're going to focus on the big ones. So a, a twist in the, in the design uh, was the following. Prior to randomizing alats into different treatment conditions, we contacted each one of the supervisors in the multi-AEA alats, and we said, hey, if you had phones only for half your agents, which half of your agents would you treat with these phones with the objective of maximizing impact and performance? Uh, so what this means is in the columns, you have how we randomly allocated alats with the agents within them. Uh, so there were three conditions, the control group where nobody got phones, 100% coverage condition where all the agents in the alat got phones, and there was a 50% coverage in which uh, we only gave phones according to the recommendation of the supervisor in the first wave, and eventually everybody got treated as well. I'm not going to use this third column today much. It's something we use for ascertaining the possibility of spillovers, which because of time constraints I won't address, except to say that we didn't find any. Um, so if you focus on the, the cells in yellow here, the, the, the main sample, what you see is for the, the plain vanilla impact evaluation question, what you want to do is look at the average performance of those who were treated, all the agents in cells B and D, and compare that with the performance of agents who were not 
treated those in cells A and C. And that difference is gonna give you the average treatment effect. Um, but we are interested to know whether supervisors have the capability of selecting agents who will be more responsive. And so the rows in this table you know, separate agents according to the supervisor indication. And so if it is true that supervisors have valuable information, the following should be true. It should be true that if I look at the treatment effect among those the supervisors selected, that is the difference between agents in cells B and A, that is people they selected, I compare treated versus control, that treatment effect should be massive. And when I look at the treatment effect over people they didn't select, that treatment effect should be small. The difference between performance of agents in cells D and C should be small. So the double difference, B minus A minus B minus C, uh, should be positive if it is true supervisors have uh, valuable information. So we're going to use that. Before getting there, let me give you a sketch of a uh, uh, framework. Um, and so after the derivations and based all on primitives of preferences and technology, we come to a, an optimal choice of effort by agents. Um, that's the share of farmers that they, they decide to visit. That's uh, S sub I, where I is each agent. Uh, this is S star because it's an equilibrium choice after optimization. And this depends on two things. One is a, a, a previous form parameter mu, uh, that's agent specific, that captures a number of inclinations towards performance that constitute or give you a baseline performance. And it depends on a second component that um, reflects the intensity of monitoring Q sub i that agent i is subjected to. And this intensity of monitoring affects each agent depending on how sensitive or responsive to monitoring that agent is. And that responsiveness to monitoring is that parameter rho sub i. So this rho is going to be a key dimension of heterogeneity for agents for us. Um, the, and, and we don't rule out the possibility that it might be negative for some agents. There might be agents who actually resent um, being monitored. And this is not crucial to the story, but it turns out there are some such people. So, but the key thing to remember is that if you increase monitoring, what you're going to do is you're going to increase Q. That means you're going to possibly have a positive effect on um, effort by agents to the extent that their rows are positive. And for those who have bigger rows, then the effects are going to be stronger. So ideally, you know, if supervisors know what they're doing, they should be picking people with high rows when they tell us who to treat. Now, if you are the minister, if you're the center, an uninformed principal, you don't know the type of these agents. You don't know the roles. So one thing you can do is if you have a lot of money, you can treat 100% of people. So on the x-axis in this graph, M is basically the rollout scale. How many agents are you going to treat? 100 is everybody, it's 100%. So if you treat everybody, then your, your overall impact is going to be basically the average treatment effect. If you were to pick people at random, uh, not 100% of people, but some, you, you pick you know, 30, 50%, pick 50%, then you're going to get half the impact. Um, and if you um, treat different percentages of people, the overall impact you get is basically a linear function, because at every point in time, you're choosing a set that compositionally is exactly the same. So the average treatment effect is always the same. And so is the marginal treatment effect as you expand rollout. But suppose instead I tell you, look, we can rely on the supervisors or someone who knows exactly these types. And I want you to treat the first 1% of agents, a small number, um, but then you should pick the ones who are the most responsive, the highest types. Then what that means, and then I tell you, well, now, now treat the second 1%. Okay, so those first two percentage points of agents are going to have very high marginal treatment effects. And so the impact curve that you're going to begin tracing looks like this dashed curve. Okay. And now, of course, as you expand, if I give you money to treat more and more people with phones, 
then the, uh, the, the impact curve is going to start converging to the point where it meets the one and the random assignment for treating everybody. Because if you're treating everybody, it doesn't really matter whether you pick at random or you pick them in order. Uh, eventually, you treat this exact same set of people. Now, when you're treating people um, uh, by treating highest types first, it could, be the pos pos it could be possible that you reach a maximum and then you have a slight decrease if you have some types who actually are these recalcitrants with negative responsiveness. That could, that could happen. So one thing this makes clear already is that if you're going to treat everybody, whether you choose in a decentralized or centralized manner, it doesn't matter. If you're going to treat a tiny number of people, it doesn't matter much either. But if you're going to treat intermediate ranges, then it could make a big difference. There's something more we can say. Now, interventions are not free. So these phones cost money. Suppose the intervention you have in mind has a cost equal to CM. Right? The more people you treat, the more you have to spend, and that's linear. It's that dashed line CM. Suppose you're an uninformed principal, then what you're going to do is you're going to compare your costs, the dashed blue line, with the solid black line. And you're going to say, well, it's the, the marginal treatment effect is always higher than the marginal cost. I want to treat everybody. Now, if I told you that the cost instead is C prime M, where the marginal cost is higher than the marginal treatment effect on the average, then you would decide that it's best not to treat anybody. So if you're a random assigner, uh, as a centralized authority, either you treat everybody or you treat nobody. But if you're a decentralized allocator and you have information about types and the costs are the low cost CM, what you're going to do is you're going to start treating people first with the highest types and then go in descending order until the marginal treatment effect is exactly the same as the marginal cost, which will happen at the point M star. If I now tell you, oh, mistake, the costs were higher, they were C prime M, then you're going to say, well, okay, that means we have to reduce rollout, and because now we need to equate again marginal cost to marginal treatment effect, and that happens at an earlier M prime uh, rollout scale. One thing that is interesting here is that if costs are C prime M, a centralized allocation would never work. You would decide it's best to forego the program. Uh, because the uh, marginal and average cost is less than the average treatment effect. But if you can allocate in a decentralized manner, then this is an intervention that has value, provided you can choose the rollout scale judiciously. So this is the way in which all these decisions of whether to decentralize and how much to expand rollout, they are interdependent. So what this means is that in real life, when we're thinking about interventions, we would really like to know the shape of all these curves to decide how to implement programs and to and, and with what rollout scale. One problem is, if you wanted to know all of these curves, typically we think, oh, we would have to have a bunch of treatment in saturation levels in order to trace this thing out. And as you see, we'll develop an approach so that we don't really need that. So uh, a number of questions emerge. Number one, the most basic, did monitoring increase AA performance? This is a traditional impact evaluation question. Um, the second is, would decentralization pay, possibly depending on the scale of rollout? And this opens two sub-questions. One, well, do supervisors have valuable information? And what do they know? Uh, are those things we could possibly know? Or do they know things that are unobservable to any conceivable analyst? And the third thing will be, can centralization ever win? If supervisors have superior information, how much information would the center have to gather to match or beat supervisors? And is that even possible? So the, the data we used came from two main sources. One was an AEA survey that uh, measured a number of characteristics of the AEAs. And then a farmer survey in two rounds where we call farmers to ask them about the, their interactions with the AEAs, whether they, they have been visiting them, what they did, how much time they spent with them. It was a, a number of questions. Uh, importantly, also including their level of satisfaction with the AEA. Uh, let me skip the balancing. The, this, uh, as with most experiments, the balancing is satisfactory. Um, now, let's go to the first question. Does monitoring increase performance? Um, 
uh, at the top we have our, our theoretical equation of, of effort and so and then the, the empirical representation of this we're going to allow the baseline level of performance to depend possibly on observables x and some unobservable but epsilon and the responsiveness to treatment beta also may respond to observables and some unobservables eta uh, the easiest um, uh, implementation of this is in a constant effects models to capture the average treatment effect and so that's what we're gonna look at uh, in this table where the dependent variable is whether the farmer we call was visited in the previous week by the AA. Uh, the mean in the um, dependent variable for the control group is 27%. And what we see is that when you treat AEAs, this goes up by in between six and seven uh, percentage points. So it's a, a, a meaningful impact uh, of the monitoring. Uh, this is also true when we focus on the multi AEA alats um, and exclude the smaller alats. Um, there is a whole other set of uh, of alats where there's only one supervisor who's his own AEA. And so this person is under no monitoring and he doesn't monitor anybody. And so we track the, the impact of the phone on these individuals to see whether phones could have a direct productivity enhancing effect. And we don't find any, which subscribes the idea that the effect we find on the agents who are supervised is due to the fact that the phones have a monitoring uh, uh, function. Um, it is the case that AEAs are more likely to respond that their supervisor knows where they are when they've been issued the phone. And we don't find that more frequent meetings come at the cost of shorter meetings. The, the length of the meetings, the farmer's report is the same. So what these six to 7% estimates allows us to say is that's the total impact you would have if you were to treat everybody. So this plot basically is the analog of the theoretical plot I showed you earlier. And of course, if we were to treat half the people, we would get half that overall impact. And if we were to treat any fraction of agents, uh, then this straight line gives us what the impact is that we would get. Now, do supervisors have valuable information uh, and could they achieve an impact that's above that line we can achieve by randomly assigning phones? Um, so the easiest way to implement this is to say, well, now the responsiveness to treatment beta here in the second bullet point can be thought of as having a baseline level B0 and then an expanded level, if beta 1 is positive, for those whom the supervisors had decided this for the decision of the supervisor to select this person for treatment. Um, and so what we're going to look for is in our specification, a positive interaction between the selection by the supervisor, that's the decision by the supervisor D, and the treatment. And so what this does is it uh, replicates the regressions I showed you before in the multi-agent alats where we also have now the interaction between treatment and selection. And what you see in these uh, three columns, two to four, is that the entire treatment effect is in fact driven by the supervisors, sorry, by the agents that the supervisors would have given the phones to. So the argument we make is, well, this reflects the fact that supervisors have superior information. Uh, we cannot reject the null of no spillovers, and we did several explorations for the possibility of Hawthorne effects, and we uh, don't think they're part of the picture. Uh, so now you may be wondering, well, okay, now these supervisors seem to know things. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, they work with these AAs all the time. Um, and, and, they, and that was apparent when we talked to them and you know, asked them about their day-to-day -day work and how they keep track of people. Um, so one question is, well, what is it that they know? And are those things that a minimally equipped government could learn on its own? Or is this something really that comes from intimate contact and, and personal contact? Um, so we're going to need now, we went from the constant FX model to the two type heterogeneity. Now we need the full heterogeneity model. And so the key objective here is to decompose the informational advantage of supervisors between things that are potentially observable, excess, right, uh, and things that are unobservable. So we're going to model the choice of supervisors 
a supervisor is having a value this by for treating uh, an agent that depends on two things. One is the true responsiveness to treatment beta that depends on some observables excess and some unobservable eta that maybe uh, only the supervisor can, can get to know. And some component psi that may reflect preferences of the supervisor. This could be bias, favoritism, whatever. And that also depends on observables and some thing that's unobservable to us. Now, supervisors were also al going to allow them to be less than perfectly informed. They are not going to observe the exact responsiveness to treatment of the agents. They're going to obtain a, a noisy signal of it. And then they're going to decide whenever they think the expected value of treating a person is larger than some cutoff. Okay. Okay. So if you allow us to do a linear parameterization of utility and of the response to treatment, you can write the expected value of treating uh, an agent in the eyes of the supervisor as depending on two components. First, we group all the observable elements that enter into the responsiveness to treatment and potentially biases the supervisor in one part, and this is the excess with the coefficient gamma, um, and a bunch of things that we really cannot hope to learn. This is the unobservables that we're going to call U. And this has two parts. There's an unobservable part that drives treatment responsiveness. This is the expectation of true treatment responsiveness, eta, um, that goes into beta uh, that, that the supervisors have in their mind. And then some potential bias that supervisors have that is also hopelessly unobservable for us. Now, we don't observe this latent index that supervisors choose to make decisions but we do observe what they select. And so we're gonna impose uh, some distribution assumptions on all the unobservable uh, terms. And once we do that, immediately what we get, or well, after some algebra, is that the, the, the decision of the supervisor of whom to treat really follows a probit specification. Basically, if you look at this expression at the top, it's clear that they're gonna, if the expected value of treating someone has to be above some cutoff for them to treat the person, then basically what you need is, given observables, you need the unobservable to be big enough. And given the assumptions on normality, that's the unobservable has a normal distribution. And so the choice to treat by a supervisor is a problem. So under the normality assumptions, we can also write uh, the expected unobservable responsiveness to the treatment eta in the eyes of the supervisor. Um, as something that depends on a ratio of uh, covariance and variance of the unobservables and something that looks very familiar. It's a Mills ratio. This is the usual uh, Heckman selection correction uh, term that, uh, that is so frequently used in, in, in selection problems. And therefore, we can write the expected performance of an agent as depending on observables, observables interacted with treatment, and the expected responsiveness to treatment that we don't know, but the supervisor does, which is the Mills ratio, interact with, interacted with treatment. So what this suggests is that if we can run a probit to understand the selection decisions of uh, supervisors, that will allow us to estimate this Mills ratio. And then we can plug that in in a second stage to basically run this regression we have right here. And what will that tell us? Well, this ratio is the connection between unobservables and the part of unobservables eta that drives treatment. If supervisors have valuable information and they're using it about unobservable drivers of treatment response, then that covariance is positive and the coefficient of the Mills ratio in our second stage regression should be positive and significant. Sorry, the Mills ratio interacted with treatment. So, that's, this just says what I just told you. Uh, let me omit the first stage and go straight to the second stage. What do we have here? The key thing to look at is this third row where we have the interaction of the Mills ratio with treatment. And what you see is a significant and positive coefficient indicating that indeed the unobservable drivers of treatment response are doing a lot of work in uh, explaining the informational advantage of supervisors. So basically with that model, we can 
uh, now, see how the supervisors fare in the analog of the theoretical graph. Uh, what we have, what I'm showing you right now is what we uh, had with random assignment. What if supervisors were to choose? Well, this is what supervisors would attain if they treated half the people using only what they know about observables, what is reflected in um, how the observables matter for their selection decisions. But if they also use the unobservable component, then they do even better. Um, and now, because we have a model that explains exactly how they choose based on observables and unobservables, the unobservables we don't have, but we have the excess, we have the observables. And then given the excess and their selection criteria, we can compute the expected unobservable at each point in time. So we can come over the entire space of observables and basically trace exactly what the impact would be if supervisors were to make decisions at all levels of rollout. And of course, our normality assumptions play a role in allowing us to complete that tracing. So one thing that is apparent here, as I mentioned earlier, is that there is a maximum that you achieve if you allow supervisors to choose. Um, and, and that um, uh, is well less than 100%. Um, so the two things that come out of this graph is unobservables play a big role, and you can maximize impact by expanding rollout to 77%. You can save on phones by treating less than uh, all the population because there are, in fact, some types that basically, if you treat them, it backfires. Um, okay, so with that, now the question is supervisors have knowledge, it's valuable. Um, it turns out you can save money and maximize impact by treating less than the full set of agents. But you know, states have different levels of capability. Some states may not be able to gather any data to compete with their supervisors, and so decentralization may be best for them. But uh, other states have a lot of capabilities to gather data and process it. And could it be the case that more capable states may want to keep the allocation centralized? What would it take? So we're going to consider three scenarios for state capacity. One is a minimally informed principle uh, that, of course, the, the super minimum would be what we already did, which is random assignment. Okay, And that clearly is worse than what the supervisors can achieve. We established that. Now let me go one step higher. Uh, this is, we give a bit of information to the principle. Let's assume the principle knows the distance that AEAs have to travel to in order to see their farmers. Let's suppose they basically give phones to the farm to the AEAs who have to travel the longest distances because presumably those are the people who are hardest to monitor. The second step would be a significantly informed principle. The principle knows the excess, knows all the demographics and so on of the of the agents, um, uh, even some of their personal characteristics, and can run a regression on baseline performance and figure out, uh, based on observables, who are the agents who are more likely to be laggards in terms of performance, and then he, and then we treat those people. Uh, or we could have a sophisticated principle that basically partners with people like all of us, runs a, a pilot experiment, and then uses the observables to run a regression where the observables predict response to treatment, not baseline performance. Okay, so we're going to look at these three scenarios. So what we have in the dotted line is the random assignment we saw before. What we have in the long dashed irregular line is what you could achieve in terms of impact if you were to prioritize by distance. This is the minimally informed principle. And what you have at the top is what you could do if you use observables to predict baseline performance. How do these compare to the supervisor? The supervisor is the solid gray regular arc here. And what this tells you is if you're going to prioritize by distance, the minimally informed principle, well, the supervisor can beat that. But if you can use observables to predict baseline performance, you can do as well as the supervisor and sometimes a bit better. And if you partner with academics to run uh, an experiment, and then use the data, 
and the unobservables to predict response to treatment and allocate the phones according to that, uh, then you can do much better. And that's the, the black dashed line at the very top. So what this is telling us is that there are ways in which a centralized authority could do better than the decentralized choice by supervisors. You may be wondering why, because after all, the supervisors have this unobservables advantage. How can we do better by using only the information in the observables? The answer is because supervisors know more, but they don't necessarily use their information optimally. They may have biases um, and they may not process the information perfectly. So what this uh, table then does is relying on all those uh, uh, on that plot is basically show you what you have in the left is the rollout scale. And what this basically tells you is, look, the optimal rollout scale uh, with the impact bolded at what it happens to be the optimal scale is different depending on how you're going to implement this intervention. It, if you want to do this at random, then you have to treat everybody. Um, but if you are going to be centralized, then as we said earlier, you're going to choose a, a scale of 77%. And if you are a sophisticated uh, state with a lot of information who can run experiments, in fact, you want to bring the rollout rate at 70% only, and you achieve the highest possible impact of 9%. And that's, that's what we can I stop that? Maybe two minutes, can you? Yep, yeah. there we are. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Good. On that note, um, <laughs> what, what have we shown that um, first, even without performance pay, which is worth reminding uh, us of, um, an increasing monitoring can increase effort by government employees. Uh, we found that the low level supervisors have valuable information about how to allocate the monitoring technology at hand. But the relative benefits of decentralizing the allocation really depend on the scale of rollout. And it's quite sensitive, whether you want to decentralize, as to you know, what kind of state do you have? How capable is the principal? Um, and the reason why, even without the unobservables, we at the center could do better is that supervisors, although well-informed, may be imperfect information processors or not fully benevolent. All of this, I think, undergirds one broad conclusion, which is in an era in which information and communication technologies are improving so much, and even governments in low and middle income countries are expanding their data capabilities, I think it might be worth rethinking the decentralization debate. And maybe there, we might be uh, entering an era in which we are going to see substantial re centralization. Um, now, of course, the value of the information different agents may have in different contexts is going to change from place to place and time to time. Um, and so I, I don't want to claim external validity for the specific findings, uh, but I think the method we develop is easily portable and can be exported to other settings. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions or hear thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, who wants to jump in first? I want to make a yeah. comment, if I may. Thanks, Ahmed. So this was super interesting. Um, I was thinking that your main graph kind of gives us an explanation of why oftentimes officials are against randomization, no? in the sense that they have these priors of who are the people that have the treatment effects, so they find it's pointless. Either you give it to all or to no one. And if you're going to select, I'm going to tell you who are the ones that have the, the greatest treatment effects, right? <laughs> so uh, I guess that uh, then one I, question. I, by the way, I think you're 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 very right uh, about that. They, I, I think, at times they may they may have difficulty squaring in their heads why we want to do something so boneheaded, uh, exactly. signing something blindly. Exactly. But they know. Yes. Yeah, but but then you know this raises two 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 questions. No, one is that well, if we let them do the business as usual, we will not be getting the causal effect. No, we will not be getting the the estimates that you know we need. And the other aspect is that we might not trust their judgment. So I agree that you find that they have valuable information, but in other instances they might not be right. Right. So I guess that. 
something that I wasn't, I, you know, like another dimension that we may want to think, no, is the congruence between the objectives of the center versus the, the supervisors, no, if, if they are misaligned, we would have. And then one, one final point that I thought that this might be super interesting to relate is this, there is this uh, new methodologies in uh, randomized evaluation of adaptative experiments that they are bringing from the medical sciences, uh, which kind of uh, what they are um, suggesting is that in order to maximize power, in order to divide the population into a big treatment and a big control, you want to do this by waves. You start by 10 observations, you see what's going on, and then you add 20 more observations, and, 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 and you design it in a way in which you could still be getting the causal estimates, but it, it allows some discretion to towards, uh, you know, who gets the treatment. So maybe, you know, somehow that could be a, a middle ground in which you would be giving these officials the ability to uh, still extract causal estimates and useful information, while at the same time you 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 bring in their knowledge to to select these different waves into into what direction. Right, right on. So uh, I, you're 100 percent right on on both counts. Um, I think it's totally possible in the graphs I showed. So if uh, let's begin with the theory graph. If um, supervisors were super non-benevolent, right? So the typical trade-off in decentralization is you give decision-making power to someone with superior information, but that someone may not have your preferences. So it could well be that that someone will choose in a way that's so against what you want that they may achieve an impact that's even worse than what you would achieve under random assignment. That's totally possible. So what the, the, the empirical findings, and I didn't emphasize that when drawing the theory graph because I was already drawing something that I knew would match what you would see in the data, right? But we could have had the supervisors doing worse. Uh, and that could have happened in the data, right? They could have done worse. Um, so what, what the empirical findings mean is not that they are benevolent. It means that on net, they have enough information they use that it may overcome any non-benevolent biases that they have. But you're absolutely right that there, are, there might be settings in which the, that nice curve of the supervisors is below. And in those cases, you, know, certain, you certainly don't want to, decent, to, to decentralize. Um, so, that, so that's one, one, one aspect. Um, the, the adaptive is, is totally right as well, I think. And, um, and in a way, this is part of the conversation we had with the board. We, we were saying, look, you can do a small experiment, learn about this, and that is going to put you in a better position then to allocate better the next, the next time, right? So certainly there is a sort of uh, dynamic view uh, to, to this that um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that people have thought deeply about how to do that uh, in a rigorous way. I, I, I'll, look, I'll look that up. So there is a, there is a question by Sabrine uh, Beg uh, from Delaware. So it's, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe she's, uh, uh, are you there? Can you, Sabrine, or not? Okay. So the question about welfare, welfare effects. Do you have any, oh. I was just wondering if you had any information, I missed this, from the farmers on, um, on production or yield or, you know, the more downstream outcomes or even from remote sensing on the, any effects on those outcomes of the experiment? Um, thank you. No, unfortunately. So at first, when we, fir when we began this, we thought that it would be possible to obtain uh, information about production and yields and things like that. Then it, it, we quickly realized, even before we launched the intervention, actually, um, that, that it would not be possible because the, the only feasible way to obtain information from the, uh, the farmers was by calling them. And these are extremely poor farmers. They don't keep like written records. You cannot ask them, you know, what was your yield you know, five months ago? Or uh, it, it became very, very hard. The other, the other aspect is that this was happening over the entire uh, territory in Paraguay and people were doing lots of different things. Uh, so we, you know, for a while we struggled to, to think about, okay, what are some common things we could ask that would give us a, a, a common measure? 
Um, so eventually we did some checks using some data the government had um, um, had gathered uh, to see whether there, there, there could have been a connection between treatment and, and, and some expanded production. And, um, and we included a mention to this uh, in the paper, but this, this, you know, I think these are rather heroic uh, uh, estimates. So, you know, th there's some indication that the, the, this had an effect on, on, on production, but I, it's not something I would push with uh, a lot of enthusiasm. So uh, let me clarify. So in uh, the, the, the question on, on, on production and welfare is obviously super relevant. One reason why I, we were not, we didn't think it was a fatal shortcoming is we wanted to do a study about um, decentralization that's based and, based and monitoring, and it's basically about moral hazard. So this is typically about, you know, what's happening to the inputs? What's, are these people exerting effort? Are they going to work? Um, we and so uh, to the extent that this was uh, uh, an experiment focused on monitoring uh, and moral hazard, we were not thinking about um, uh, as although we think it's important, we didn't think it was the the, the most germane aspect to our study to to go and and, and trace all the potential production uh, impact. Yeah, so, so maybe let me ask a, 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 maybe some kind of big picture question here. So in the literature, decentralization is not just about the instrumental value of decentralization. You know, the fact that uh, that you capture very well through the information uh, effect and so on. But there is something yeah. intrinsic, empowering about decentralization. You know, regardless the fact that you are in charge, the fact that you know, it it's also has value and can generate high effort and so on. So is there any evidence or any way this idea can be captured? Uh, yes, not in this study, but I, I, I would, I, that's a fascinating question. I agree with you that there is an instrumental value to decentralization and there is a, a symbolic or uh, intrinsic value. Um, one context in which this point has been made is the context of democracy. And I, one study that I, I like a lot, and uh, I'm biased, but uh, uh, has my brother as the co one of the co-authors. It's a paper in the American Economic Review. Yes, of course. Um, on the, the effects of, the, it's called the effects of democracy, right? Showing that indeed when people get to choose the game they're going to play, and they move from a prisoner's dilemma to a coordination game, once they hit the coordination game, they coordinate on the good equilibrium way more often than if they were sent to play the coordination game by the computer. Yeah. Which is, I find a striking, a striking result. I think that's the only study I, f I know that can get in the context of an experiment to be some notion of buy-in or legitimacy yeah. from yeah. the process by which we get to a point uh right above and beyond the instrumental value uh, but i i think you're right and so if we import this to this context you're right that you may think look you may recentralize because now you have a lot of computers and you have ai and you have analysts who can do machine learning and basically you can set up an office in the capital city of any developing country you put three smart people to work, and provided they have the minimum infrastructure to gather the data, they can do a lot of things. But I think you're right. We should think about, well, is that going to disempower uh, middle managers? Is that going to uh, affect negatively on the intrinsic motivation side? Yeah. Um, further down in the hierarchy, I think it's a great point. Yeah, so no, I think there is a the, the selected trial paper that gets a little bit to that, you know, where when you choose your your own treatment, then it has some intrinsic effect that you can capture. So, yeah, yeah. and also doing something on, along those lines. So, um, so there is a, a, a question uh, by. Uh, yeah. yeah, I did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, about <laughs> what are the next steps or future directions for researchers working on multi tier principal agent hierarchies? Uh, great question. Let's brainstorm. Let's write a paper. <laughs> Um, 
I so I don't know. I think we we are beginning to see work along uh, these lines. Uh, I, you know, some of some of that um, we've seen um, in the context of the EDI initiative that some of us have have been uh, close to. Uh, I don't know if Gianmarco is in the audience right now, but Gianmarco and um, Erika de Serrano have a paper where they play with uh, the way uh, people in a health frontline provision hierarchy are paid and whether you pay supervisors and agents equally or one or the other. So there is an interesting question about you have a pot of money, you have to give money to people in your hierarchy to do things. Who do you pay more? Who do you give bonuses to? you give bonuses to the supervisors so they really supervise hard the agents or do you give bonuses to the agents directly or you know, so i think there are interesting questions about how to distribute um, payment schemes uh, how to play with the conditionality and i think the same could be true about monitoring right so I mean, supervisors have to be monitored too presumably and so maybe you simply just get very tough on the supervisors themselves um, so those are some of the things that i think we haven't figured out you know, where do we tighten the screws more yeah. okay fantastic so uh thank you very 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 much uh, that was uh, super interesting and thank you for the invitation and the comments and questions i really appreciate it. Yeah, much more to come. I think I, we can engage uh, bilaterally as well.